I'm so excited to be here and I'm even more excited to introduce these four amazing poets, authors, and just all around really cool people. Um, as somebody who writes poetry, it's so important to read and um, listen to and just take in po poetry and art from people that resemble me and come from my communities. And this anthology is so incredible. And I would highly recommend all of you um, buy a copy and read it because some of the poetry in there is truly transcendent. Um, I'm going to introduce the four poets on our pa panel and then give each of them a little bit of time to talk and share some poetry. And then after that, we'll transition to a Q&A. And it's all going to be really great. So I hope you all stay tuned. Um, the first poet that I'm going to introduce is Kazem Ali. Kazem was born in the United Kingdom and has lived transnationally in the United States, Canada, India, France, and the Middle East. His books encompass multiple genres, including several volumes of poetry, novels, and translations. He is currently a professor of literature at the University of California, San Diego. His, new, his newest books are a volume of three long poems entitled The Voice of Sheila Chandra and a memoir of his Canadian childhood, Northern Light, Power, Land, and the Memory of Water. Please join me in welcoming Kazim Ali. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's really good to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm going to read some poems from my new book that Mal mentioned, The Voice of Sheila Chandra. And then I will also read a poem from uh, this beautiful anthology, The World That Belongs to Us. The title poem in this book, The Voice of Sheila Chandra, um, is de dedicated to the British Indian singer Sheila Chandra, who started out her career as a pop singer and then moved into devotional music. She sang drones. She also um, made albums just of conical music, which is uh, the type of music where the singer imitates percussion. And so that is somewhat what some of the poems in this book also do. Breaks is constant, was like the river, light on the river, riven that remained a rift, an old rill that sounded, she merged with the vibe, ration of the drum, a hum, a home, womb, and um, she, om, moaned in the loam, dark, earth, come, Sheila, dame, ocean, dome, this poem, roam to tome, tomb, foam, original fountain that fed my mom, zum zum, when I was born. Who can, in syllables like Sheila, Chandra, moan, us covered in a blanket of sound, this like cloud bank of stars keeping us from eternity, which under the blanket seem like Sanjay, a dancer who I somehow look like and was mistook for three times in one day 20 years ago, but the story still resounds. Some woman at a festival saw him perform, swore I was he. I said I wasn't, she did not believe. Long before she lost it, drifts unanchored, wanted to merge, and the body of the singer became the body of the instrument. Talk to the drum, find it, hum, study its vowels. She made her vow to sound slowly, syllable by syllable. Uzbek, a language she did not know, but learned, she pronounced the words unmoored, word, pure, sound, oh, river, long had I been, long seasons, invaded by your current, devoured your tongue of water, those years time bent, my one voice spoke. Now, 
Do I always turn to the tenor stricken? I have no fear of God, but of being this archangel unfolding to emerge from God into form. How untoward, above and below the line of having lived, I abstain, bound to the horizon, not earth, not sky, not Sheila, sings, the voice breaks, the body breaks, stations of the cross or Jewish texts that blank out one vowel, unspeakable Zen mind is not empty mind, but mind river that knows it flows. Let me get there past years or drink or sex. When I saw the dog after a decade, he only wanted to look at me, lick me, smell me. How to transcribe what flickers what is not fixed, that voice letters made not of ink but light, not of words of fire on stone. How do you transcribe the blank vowel, all the after that aerates, not disappear but settle down through air? You do not want to say but sing, where might be rain, be sky, come down by snow, but no, you invite it to cover you, the blanket, your coat, a heavy pressure, God, pressure of rain. You want to start the song over, but do not dare to be ready. No tune, no cadence, nothing to pick up, no bridge to cross. Now to be small again, break through. There is no beginning to any song, only the place the singer picks up the tune. So that's from the voice of Sheila Chandra. And then I'll close with a poem from the anthology. Um, and this is a poem by Nishant Singh Thakur. And his bio is uh, Nishant Singh Thakur um, hails from Damo, Madhya Pradesh. He strives to e explore love, hatred, humanity, and every such feeling with the beauty of words, a magnificent source for all his content and sarcastic memes. He lives in Bhopal. So this poem is written in Hindi and it's translated by Akhil Katyal. The Hindi's not here, so I'm just going to read the translation. Wandering even now, who just stepped out from his home? Who just started for his home? Who turned around to see it one more time? And who turned back to find again the city he left behind? He who lived far from his home till now, Look at how he sees a whole city in a home. And he who left to roam like a nomad, who is wandering even now, look at how he sees, is it a joy? Is it a pity? A home in every city. Thank you so much, Kazim. Um, so poetry for me is something that has always like filled me up like water in a glass. And it also describes the parts of us that are in between, I think our language, our conversations with each other. And thank you for filling me up a little bit, cousin. That was so, so, so beautiful. Um, the next poet on our panel is Rajiv Mohabir. Rajiv is the author of The Cowherd Son, winner of the 2015 Kundiman Prize, um, and Eric Koffer Honorable Mention of 2018, and The Taxidermist Cut, which is, which is the winner of the four-way books intro to Poetry Prize, and the finalist for the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry in 2017, and translator of I Even Regret Night. Holy Songs of Demerara, um, which received a Penn slash Heim Translation Fund Grant Award. His memoir won the 2019 Reckless Books New Immigrant Writing Prize and is forthcoming in 2021. Currently, he is an assistant professor of poetry in the MFA program at Emerson College. 
tra and a translations editor at Waxwing Journal. Thank you so much for joining us, Rajiv, and I'll um, take it away. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you so much, Mel. Thank you, uh, you know, for inviting me here. Thank you, Kazim, for your beautiful words and for the reading as well that you've given. And I'm so glad to be engaged in this conversation with you all tonight. And thank you to everyone who is uh, listening and watching. Um, I'm gonna start with a poem um, that's not in the anthology and it's uh, from a, a collection that's forthcoming in 2021. Uh, called Cutlish. And this form of poem is a Chutney poem that's based on Chutney music, which in the Caribbean is a, uh, a kind of uh, popular music where people dance, that people dance to. And one of the things to, or there's several like constrictions here that I gave myself as I was drafting these poems. Um, and uh, they had to conform to certain um, uh, things. For example, the, the, the first couplet should function as a chorus and it should be in Caribbean Hindustani um, and in my case Guyanese Bhojpuri. Um, and then uh, you know there should be a certain amount of syllables per line and everything. Once upon a time uh, the, the first drafts of all of these poems were singable to the song Kaise Bani um, and that's like a little like intimacy that I have with this poem, um, these poems anyway that I'm sharing with you today. So this is called The Poco Kid. Matahet Logan Bolna Sakela Darasana Nahim Hurjake Maran. Let's get one thing queer. I'm no Sabu like sidekick. I'm the main drag. Ram Ram in a sari. Salam on the street. I don't speak Hindu, Paki, or Indian. Can't control minds. Have no psychic powers. I clip my yellow nails at dusk. On Saturday nights, I shave my head. Forgive me, Shiva. Forgive me, Saturn. I'm Cooley on Liberty Ave, Daisy in Jackson Heights, where lights spell season's greetings to cover Christmas, Diwali, and Eid, where white folks in ethnic aisles ask, will your parents arrange your bride? while Ma and I scope out fags, gaff and laugh, while aunties thread our eyebrows. The subaltern cannot speak. Representation has not withered away. Um, and so that last couplet is the translation of the Caribbean Hindustani that came before and um, uh, excerpted text from Gayatri Spivak's um, you know, seminal text, um, can a subaltern speak? But I wanted to kind of point out that I haven't been getting uh, any kind of threadings for for a, a, a long time now. So, um, you know, that this poem was, the seed of the poem was planted in 2013. Um, and so I'm gonna turn now to uh, uh, my poem called Inside the Belly in this beautiful collection. Um, and I'm gonna read just two parts and then end with the Chutney poem that's in here too. Inside the belly. One, the seaman James Bartley screams as he slides down a sperm whale's throat in 1891. He was in the stomach for 15 hours, unconscious in the stench of digesting fish. He survived after his shipmate sliced the belly open and pulled his twitching body into, the, into bed where he stayed for almost a month. If this happened today, he would take 70 selfies and post them online. According to the tales, he lost his sight and his skin whitened. He wasn't holding any blade. Two, a black swallower, a type of fish, can take a man twice as big as himself, his jaws distensible. Catching them by the tail, he walks them over to his mouth. This is the marine biology of deadly desire. By most imperial standards in 1891, the British East India Company called my biology a metaphor for black. I am dark skinned. As a child, I prayed to be white until my foreskin started to whiten. 
This is not the deep sea, so spotting men is not impossible. The internet, too, is a type of black swallower. Um, and to get uh, more of the, the 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 gory details, you'll have to read it in the in the in the in the anthology. So, um, with the one minute remaining, I'm going to finish with my last chutney poem called "Interpreting Behaviors." Bina jawab bara saal se bulawat hai, jaane ki koi nahi sunal. Today, scientists take interest in the things that do not occur with equal frequency. For example, why doesn't the only other brown fag on Oahu text after you harpoon each other at Leahi Park? Does his tail slap mean to silence your calls when you say we're one species? You swallow a sea of krill and upside down sing the Cindy folk song he taught you when the British sailed. What weakness did they leave? Does he mean your connection was one-sided, like Kamiko's whale, crooning at fifty-two hertz, the only of his kind, who can sing his poetry to you in Hindi? For twelve years, he's been calling out to no response. That it knew no others listened. And um, that final couplet is, uh, you know, of course, the the chorus that I read in the beginning, and it's from Kamiko Han's poem "Ode to Fifty Ode to Fifty Two Hertz." Thank you. Wow! Thank you so much. That was incredible. I really love the ocean, and I love gay people, and you just put that all together in a really incredible way. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to read the different part, the all of the parts of your poem in the book. Um, wow, this is so exciting. I, I love poetry so much. Um, the next amazing person that we have for all of you is named Ad Adgas Aftab. Adgas is a writer, reader, and dreamer from Pakistan, currently getting their PhD in decolonial trans literature. Some of their words can be found in Bitch Media, The Rumpus, Yes Poetry, TSQ Now and Transcendent Four, the year's best speculative transgender fiction. These days, Adgas is thinking about climate, ca climate catastrophes, the anti-colonial growth of weeds, and the healing power of poetry. Please join me in welcoming Adgas. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Tasveer, for inviting me. Um, it's a great honor to be in such a good company. Um, I have been inspired by all the poets here, um, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. Before I start, I do want to say that when I was invited, I was nervous because I felt like I am not nearly as prolific as the writers over here. But then I had to remind myself of why I started to write poetry in the first place. And the reason I started to write poetry was basically to give voice to my inner child, um, the, sar the sarcastic child, the irreverent child, the truth seeking child in me, and the child who was um, often too full and too empty at the same time. And the child who was always searching for feelings who um, I hadn't felt yet, but I knew existed and could be felt. Um, I So it, it never really was about literary merit for me. Um, so I think that's something that makes me anxious, but that I, I also have to like silence in my, in my own self. Uh, I write for healing, uh, for my own healing and for the healing of other people, particularly the healing of queer Muslims. Um, and of course, I, I'm a PhD student in literature, so it's really hard to silence that uh, inner critic in me who is constantly telling me that like something about the form is wrong, something about the aesthetics is weak. Um, but I try to silence that, that critic um, and really channel the, the inner child um, who is writing for community and for love and for spiritual and sexual healing. So the poem that I'm going to read for you all is actually the first queer poem that I wrote as an adult and that I that I was able to, to um, publish. And I was able to publish this once I 
had queer community and once I knew that this poem could be heard and seen in ways that I wanted. So this poem is called Prayer. I wrote this when I was praying, um, so it truly is a prayer for me. The first time God wept lonely next to me, touched inside, touching me. I was on my prayer mat, eyes closed, vibrator buzzing, Allah's palms clutching me. The first time I unlearned shame, I fucked Allah so intense and so lush, she had to moan earth into a foggy shudder. Though there was no skin, no hair, no soft to taste, I lay on the aging prayer mat, weeping one moment and laughing the other as I wrestled God from wrath to mercy, shredding all skins of spotted memory. You see, the thing about shame is the time lapse. It took them generations to build this body because they had to drill skin, bone, vein again and again and again with grief so deep, no amount of excavation could have undone the root. And I tried to be my archeologist, digging into my skin to find the fossils of flashbacks, digging through my flesh to efface the remains of lingering genders, but no amount of desecrating the body purified anyone's spirit. So when I came on the prayer mat, I knew this vibrator was just an excavation tool in my discovery, just an exercise to wipe the centuries old stain, just an extra push to slide out of sticky inherited guilt. What I had truly needed all this time was to fuck everything sacred, to wet everything dry and pure, to feel the dirtiest, smelliest, unholiest parts of this body, lay myself in pieces to build a shrine which God would visit when she needed some quiet reflection time. Because neither Allah nor I had ever wanted to be the ones sobbing silently outside the shrine. We both wanted to ball circles into its straight bricks, to stretch its pillars with every tired yawn. So when I breathed deeply on the prayer mat, I swallowed my own shrine whole until its dome choked me sexy. And finally, I became intimate enough with God to stop fearing her. So the next poem that I'm going to read for you all is the poem that's in this um, really amazing anthology. I'm so excited to be here, so honored to be part of this anthology. I think this, this anthology is um, world making and world changing. So my poem in this anthology is called All Death. Teach your students trans petals and poetics, just not all death. Critique, critique, critique racing states, but you too sought all death. Pretend you breathe life into humans by reading a fresh big books. Oh, come on now, a shift in hermeneutics, never fought all death. God rolled her eyes at liberals so hard, her gaze got stuck in Firdos. White professors still strut silly, even after their pens begot all death. A friend texts another suicide attempt, another tectonic plate splits. Weeping in panic, as Rail promises, he did not plot all death. Exhausted, you beg her, tear open my scalp and lick my bleeding brain. The tools are ready. No, use your nails. In bed, you forgot all death. Tonight, you want hard choking, her curls co coiled around your neck. Sweet way to lose breath. Maybe her tenderness will come blot all death. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for reminding us to take note of our inner child and reminding us like what poetry means in the first place. It's not about merit or fame, it's about expressing ourselves. And also I really wanna note like how tangible your poetry is and how like rooted in the body and God and sexuality, I think have always been kind of the same thing for me in a lot of ways. And I really, really loved your poem. Thank you so, so much for sharing that. Wow. Yeah. Um, the next and last, but definitely not least um, person on our panel is Ruth Vanita. 
Ruth has taught at Delhi University for 20 years and is now professor at the University of Montana. She volunteered as founding co-editor of Manushi from 1978 to 1990 and was active in the Indian women's movement during these years. She's the author of several books, including A Play of Light, Selected Poems, Sappho and the Virgin Mary, Same Sex Love and the English Literary Imagination, Love Right, Love's Right, Same Sex Marriage to India, Gender, Sex and the City, Urdu Rekti Poetry in India, 1780 to 1870, Dancing with the Nation, Courtesans in Bombay Cinema. She co-edited the pioneering Same Sex Love in India. She has translated many works of fiction and poetry from Hindi and Urdu to English. Her first novel, Memory of Light, appeared from Penguin in 2020. Also on a personal note, Ruth um, was kind of the first queer Indian person I ever studied in university. And it's an incredible honor to be here right now with you. Um, and yeah, welcome here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to show the cover of my uh, novel, Memory of Light. It's about um, a relationship between two courtesans in Lucknow in the late 18th century. Um, and it was published with Penguin in July. Uh, so I'm going to read three short poems. Uh, as um, Mal mentioned, I worked on Manushi and in the women, in Indian women's movement, which at that time was not at all interested in sexuality and was kind of scared of mentioning lesbianism for fear of being labeled man-hating. Um, it was only years later I found out that many of the leaders of the movement were themselves lesbian or bisexual, but uh, not openly so. Um, in, uh, in 1979, I published the first sort of openly explicit lesbian poem in Manushi. Uh, I, it's one of the earliest published in India. Anyway, so this, no, this uh, I used to travel on buses in Delhi a lot. And this, the first poem is called Sonnet for a Stranger, Delhi, 1989. The rush hour bus threw us together. I, a worker for married women's rights. You, a cog in their men's machines. Without speaking, without our eyes meeting, half an hour told us more than our mothers, friends, comrades, colleagues will ever know. Leaning across an abyss, our bodies greeting, risked all, reclaimed all, fell apart with a shudder. Nothing about us was pretty, we were each other. On the next bus, I knew what your thoughts were, thinking them, and through the window, saw as in a dream, a tall, gaunt stranger, day's floodlights, fixed on her mask of grief. Um, the next one was written in the 90s, early 90s. Uh, it's called Speech. The first word you said was not love. The first word when you lay, eyes shut, in a darkened afternoon room, when you stood looking down at me, meteor in midnight leather, when you knelt on a yielding carpet, your mouth an unstereotyped rose, when your hair caught in my lips and had to be gently unwound, when you came at the start and before you spoke, your first word, your first dream, whisper it, cry it aloud, shine on me, rain on me, rise slowly on the horizon and say, when I ask the same syllable, bless me with simple things, ring me round, will me to be found, yes, yours, yes, and again, again, yes. And uh, the last one I'm going to read, um, it was inspired by the erstwhile colleague, Pranita Sharma. Um, I, I teach at the University of Montana and she was teaching here too. And so she was asking me, she asked me, um, did you belong to any group of gay Indian poets in India when you were living there? Because I lived there till the age of 40 and I still yeah, spend time in India every year. This year I can't go. Um, and uh, she, um, and I never thought of that. <laughs> when she said that, I uh, realized that no, I didn't know any gay Indian poets at all. I didn't know any gay people for 10 or 20, 12 years during the movement. And I knew that I met some gay men and I, I knew only one les self-identified lesbian. So it was a, all a matter of guesswork. I knew Suniti Nam Joshi's work. I found it and then she became a friend and I later found Vikram Seth's work. Uh, but that was it. I didn't, um, I, as far as Indians were concerned, I didn't know any other writers. So anyway, so this was in response to what she asked. It's called Gay Indian Poets. For years, it lay quiet in a corner. The answer, a mirror caked with dust, till a slant question set it dazzling. To what school of poets did you belong? She asked. Belong? Where? In what world? There was a you, an I, but no, no we. 
The dead were speaking and I overheard enough to stammer. Song needs windows, maybe one will do if through the bars a king may hear a minstrel serenade. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Ruth. And yeah, the knowing other gay Indian poets is really important. And thank you for sharing that last poem. That was really nice. Um, so we're done with the poem and performance section of today's panel. And now we're going to get on to another fun part where we're all going to talk to each other. And I prepared a couple questions, but we're already seeing some questions come in, which is very exciting. So I think we're just going to kind of go to that, but I'm just going to start, start reading them. Um, so Alka asks all of the panelists, do you see your academic and creative lives as extensions of each other? Anybody want to start? Thank you. I think Ruth should start. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to some extent, yes. For this last novel, um, I had I had written a book about Lucknow Urdu poetry, and it had got hold of my imagination. And so the love story is set in that world, which uh, I was myself immersed in because of my other interests. Right? And in another way, no, I think academic writing really gets in the way. You have to write in a certain way and it gets in the way of your mind. Another part of your mind turns, my mind turns on when I'm writing fiction or poetry. It just works differently. And I think they don't always go together. Well. Yeah. Um, I, I, I too um, think that there can be a tension between um, one's life as a creative artist and the day the day job or day work of being an academic, which includes much more than solely classroom teaching, of course. Um, but it has fed it for me in a way, um, uh, you know, preparing, uh, lecturing in different subjects and, uh, you know, doing research on, uh, you know, other poets and writing about other poets critically um, has helped me to think more deeply about poetry, I think. Um, there were two really um, great mentors that I had and models. Um, one is, of course, the late and great Agha Shahid Ali, um, who was a scholar. He wrote about T.S. Eliot, but he really devoted himself the most strongly to poetry and to translation to a lesser degree. Um, but so much so that he achieved his PhD first, then went, went to for an MFA after. <laughs> and then mostly made his career as a teacher of creative writing. And the second, of course, I mean, I think she is, I saved the best for last, Mina Alexander, who, uh, she did it all. She edited, she translated, she wrote poetry, um, and she was a critic um, Brit of British Romanticism. She wrote a couple of beautiful books on uh, Mary Walsencraft and Dorothy Wordsworth. Um, as well as he did all this writing and, and, ment and taught PhD students and mentored them. So there's no reason why one, you know, I think Ruth is right. There's, you know, different parts of your brain and you have, you have to create the time um, to do the work. Um, but to me, Mina proved that you can, uh, um, you don't, you know, you, you have to choose one or the other in your focus and production, but you don't have to choose one or the other in your life. Gotcha. Yeah, I like that choosing one or the other for the focus. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think that I, to be involved in any kind of academic trajectory, it's like, I feel as though you have to do so many things as a poet and a writer. It's you have to, you know, have that critical aspect as well as the creative. And, you know, what happens when your poems are like really critiques? <laughs> and I, I'm not saying that that couldn't be like an intervention, like a very important poetic intervention that we see happening, especially in the Pacific, um, you know, where the, the poem does have that kind of um, uh, intellectual stake. Um, I think that um, I, I, I think it's a matter of what is in the, the, the focus for, for you and what you're drawn to more. I mean, uh, for me, it is definitely like thinking of my, my writing as creative and art. Um, and I think that that tension with the academy is something that is not always productive for me personally. So. Okay. 
I think for me, the worst thing that, that, that ever happened to my poetry was actually academia. Um, I used to write a lot when I was young. And then when I started college, I stopped writing because I was studying English and I was just so critical of everything that I read. Um, so I think that both for me definitely don't mix together. I um, feel like the day when I can do a lot of academic writing, I cannot do any creative writing. Uh, and I really have to like silence my academic voice in, in, in order to be creative. Um, yeah. Gotcha. So it sounds like all five of you kind of have some similar, but also kind of different experiences of academic writing and poetry. Um, Roshni asks all the panelists, what brought you to poetry as your performed form of writing and expression? And I guess like, is it your preferred form of writing and expression? Are there any, are there other artistic expressions that you feel called to more than poetry? Yes, I guess my mother brought me to it. She used to go around uh, the house doing the home, uh, housework, reciting poetry aloud. She recited Keats and Shelley and Wordsworth and Tennyson and uh, Shakespeare. And all that went into my mind. I learned a lot of poetry by heart in that way. So um, any experience I have, a line from some poet comes into my head. And lines from Hindi film songs come into my head in the same way too. So it's both. <laughs> That's incredible to get such a gift from your mother in that way. What about the rest of you? I think for me, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you please. Uh, it was just growing up in like a culture where I was listening to ghazals all the time and not not thinking of them as poetry. But I think once I started to sort of think about them, not simply as a song and, and also as like really important lyrics mm. um, that have a certain form, it really made me um, feel like poetry can do something that other uh, forms of writing don't really do. And that's like really getting at something that you can feel. Um, I also write speculative fiction because I like world building um, and that requires a different but also similar creative process. I think I'm a poet because I really wanted to be a singer and I failed terribly. Like <laughs> in my family, my sister is really good at singing and um, I, you know, I wish I had that magic. Like um, I think that it is magic and transformative in a way, you know, the marriage of voice and sound and, and all of this. Uh, and I, I want to say also that, um, you know, being drawn, as Atlas, you were saying, um, to the, the lyrics of, uh, you know, poetry that's performed was also a thing that, like, I was, like, captured by in my family. Um, nobody really understood what my grandparents would be singing. Um, and then, you know, in a, in a process of discovery uh, of relearning language and, you know, really like seeing what this was about, I discovered a world of poetry. Now, it turns out that like writing poetry as a young uh, person, um, it was a way for me to hide my queerness, but having it be like very um, front and center because my parents still don't read my poetry. <laughs> so, you know, there's this kind of like, you know, life saving thing that it also did for me that I was like, oh, actually I've been doing this for a long time. And, yeah, let's see what let's see what could happen when I turn up the volume. Yeah, poetry is medicine. I am it saved my life totally. Cousin, what brought you to poetry? Well, I do like the idea that you talked about, Reggie, which is like poetry is a place where secrets can be told, in a sense. Um, and I think that we all maybe have came from cultures, uh, you know, in the Muslim culture too. I grew up listening to. Quran recitation and the Wishiyas. So I, I grew up listening to the Marcias and you know the morning songs. So I think I always had that sense of rhythm and rhyme really early. Um, and I just loved poetry in school always. So I never really imagined I would write it, but, um, but I loved listening to it and I loved reading it. Um, I, do, I write in multiple modes um, and they all give me pleasure for different reasons. Um, I write poetry, I write nonfiction. I'm currently writing a um, YA uh, queer inclusive Indo-centric choose your own adventure fantasy novel. <laughs> um, so I just think there's lots of different modes of expression and, you know, probably in a way uh, I too became a, poet because I couldn't escape it. You know, it just, it's the thing that claimed me and didn't let go of me. 
And that's probably true of most poets because I think if you can escape it, you do escape it and you just write fiction or something else that maybe is more people read. <laughs> I think those of us who devote so much time and energy to it and desperate, you know, desperate uh, with desperate affection is because uh, it has seized a hold of us. We are a little mad for it. Yeah, that's true. Like, poetry is, it draws you in and then you're there. It's not a logical choice if you're a writer and you really, you want a wide audience, you know? Yeah, yeah it's, it's not about fame all the time. <clears throat> um, We've gotten a couple of questions about the anthology that I'm also very interested about. Um, I'd love to hear your experience of putting the anthology together. So was it a collaborative um, experience? Did you like meet new people? Did you form new relationships? And how did you choose which poems to submit? Like what were your queer poet, your queer writings to submit as all of us are queer in some way? Um, so I, are, I don't think there are any editors of the anthology with us, are there? No. Oh, so you're just talking about us, how yes. we chose. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I think it's kind of fantastic that, first of all, these two, you know, Aditi and Akhil, who put to, who did all of this work, and they do describe in the acknowledgement section of the anthology, which is normally the section that people don't even read, but they do describe in the acknowledgement section you know, how this community got built. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier before we got on the call when we were in the like little pre-Zoom room, we were talking about the very early days of the internet and how LGBTQ uh, Muslims started to find each other in those spaces, the Yahoo groups. There was a Yahoo group called Al-Fatiha. Um, and, you know, that's the kind of way, the way that that kind of community happened. And so, you know, you have people like, you know, Ho Shang Merchant, for example, or um, who's in the anthology, uh, uh, or Ruth, uh, you know, who are really, you know, established, uh, you know, people have known their work for a long time and have been publishing their work for a long time. But so many other people in this anthology who are young people who maybe haven't even published anything before. I mean, I think that's the most powerful part of it is the expression of, 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 you know, queer bravery, basically, um, that the world is not even ready for this anthology. And, the, and there were even people who couldn't or wouldn't be in it. And so there is a page in the anthology to represent all of the reasons why people wouldn't be in this anthology, including, uh, you know, using different names. Or There are people who've used pseudonyms in here too, but, you know, this blank page to me is such a powerful page of this book because it reminds us that even though this book is here, you know, that future that we still have to build um, for all the voices to be free to for people to express and be who they are. Yeah. Yeah. How did the rest of you pick the pick which poems you submitted or I, I don't actually know what the process was. Did you get to pick? I think when I was submitting uh, my stuff to the anthology, I was thinking of who the readers will be and um, who my co-poets would be. And I, I was wondering about like what kind of voices are going to be invisible in this like larger South Asian queer representation. Mm. And I, I felt like I needed to speak to uh, like specifically to queer Muslims because I've been in a lot of queer South Asian spaces and they are usually dominated by like the same kind of person, which is like the um, uh, dominant caste, middle upper class um, Indian person. And I felt like I needed to insert like a different kind of voice. And I was just thinking about like, why do I need to be there? Um, and what kind of words could resonate with like another young queer reader who might be reading um, the poems. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm so glad that your work is in the anthology and that you're here. 
for me, it was kind of like submitting a packet of things that like could wildly fit the description, right? Like queer South Asian. Uh, I feel like I don't even know like what South Asian means, like being from the, the, the Indian labor diaspora, you know, my family hasn't been in South Asia since the 1890s and 1860s. Um, so there's that part of it um, that I feel like I wanted to give some pieces that had some interesting kind of intersections with like the very like contemporary as well as like, you know, the historical accounting. So hence my internet poem about how to find people kind of like echoic of echolocation um, you know, speaking to this idea of how do you locate folks. Um, for me, it was Grindr and Scruff. I met my partner using one of these apps um, when I was living in Hawaii. And like, while I was doing that also with that last poem that I read, um, you know, that was actually an experience that I had when I met uh, somebody who was South Asian on in Oahu who was queer. And like, you know, we like, you know, um, perform public acts, let's just say. And I thought that that also needed a, a place in the anthology. <laughs> so. Um, you know, and definitely making room for that kind of queerness in my poetry is uh, something that I'm pushing myself into. Yeah. What about you, Ruth? Do you want to share anything? I'm not sure how I picked. I think I picked one poem garment, both were written in the 90s, and I picked one poem garment, which uh, has been published, but not, I think, very widely read. And the other one after had not been published. So I just picked one published, one unpublished. <laughs> gotcha. And Ruth, actually, we got a question for you specifically, and it's Alka asks you, why is it important to go back to the past to talk about same-sex love in the present? Why is it important um, for you? Because I think there is no present without a past. And even as we speak, the last five minutes are now the past. So where do you draw that line? <laughs> uh, and I think for me, may not be for everyone, Knowing history is very, very important because otherwise, if you don't know history, a lot of myths and stereotypes and absolute lies about history are in circulation. And it makes a great difference to know what history was of yeah. anything, but of this in particular. I think there's been so many um, uh, lies about uh, same sex sexuality that have been, that are still prevalent, but are now sort of declining because now the history is available. So, yeah. Yeah, and the people that write history are the people that have the power to define present truth a lot of the time. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, Deepa asks, for those of you who write incredibly personal poetry, how do you set boundaries for yourself regarding the vulnerability of that kind of exposure? And then clarify that I don't mean that question in terms of closetedness, although it could be, but also in terms of sharing heavy or intimate experiences. And as we just talked about, I know some of you share some pretty intimate experiences in your poetry. So. Yeah, it's a good question. I think particularly when you're writing, even in fiction, not just poetry, uh, you draw on your own experience and the experience of your friends. And then I, I feel you do need to check with them. And I, I do check if it's a love poem or something. And, if there's some detail in it that might give away the other person's identity, who may be out but still may not want all these details, you have to sort of, I do sort of check. And uh, it was very funny. It was my first anthology of poetry play of uh, life. Um, it got very good reviews in India, but one review said, oh, it's because I, the poems were written in the IU form, uh, which is a typical love poem form. And she, uh, the reviewer, who was a woman, said, um, Oh, she's a feminist, but she's writing in, in to, to a man in such uh, uh, such a object sort of way. I thought it was very amusing that she assumed it was a man. But, yeah. Sometimes people just don't understand what you're putting down. What about the rest of you? How do you manage that line? I think it's a very difficult question to answer because um, in some ways, the line isn't managed. One feels that um, the silence that that um, has been imposed often upon queer voices, um, and that sometimes, you know, looking into the past, one reads Jose as Jose Munoz said, you know, one re finds queer history in the gaps and the silences. So if there's some king who is a bachelor, you know, and you say, okay, let's. <laughs> talk about what that maybe could mean, you know? Um, and so as a writer, this is my cat, I'm sorry. Hi, She's Katie. always interested when I'm uh, talking to the computer, when I'm paying more attention to the computer than her. Um, so as a writer, one has to, 
one has those strictures in one's own life too. And I think that there were times when I myself uh, wasn't ready to write about certain things, to write about being queer, to write about, you know, different lovers, what have you. And now to be able to think about writing about my own family as well. Um, and so we, we can't pretend that there aren't those pressures that exist. Um, to kinds of censorship that are not easy to, um, that are not easy to map and they're culturally specific. So this is a conversation with the mainstream uh, publishing world or editorial world um, that it's not so simple, I think. Uh, it's not so simple to say you should write what you like and it's your life and you're entitled to it. And, um, you know, our families don't always work that way. We don't think that way all the time. When I say we, I mean like a brown we. Um, so, I mean, I empathize with every writer. The only thing I can tell you is you can write what you want. You may maybe are not ready to publish it, um, but in and of itself, engaging with really difficult um, subject matter is, you know, just earlier today, I was thinking about Marguerite de Ross's um, book, The Lover, and I was listening to a podcast about The Lover. And one of the panelists said, this isn't a book that a young person could write. It, it almost had to be a book that some, a woman in her seventies who did, lived all of this life. So we're not, we can't even confront everything in our own lives. We can be aware of it, we can live it, but if we can't write it right now, we can't write it right now. And we, you know, it'll be a future poem or a future book, you know, so. Yeah. Things have their time, I guess, yeah. even in our own lives. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely agree with Kazim. I, I also think that this is a question that's difficult to answer and that I don't really have answers for. Uh, it's something that I'm grappling with all the time. I do know that I some of my best poems that I've written were actually under a pseudonym that I did not share with anyone um, except like two of my closest people. And I, uh, I think that it was because of the pseudonym that I was able to explore um, really, really sort of unnamed feelings um, and put it out there in the world also. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for folks who are concerned about that, I think pseudonyms do help a lot. Um, but I have also, the, the ones that I've published with my own name, I usually, when I, when I publish it, I usually just tell myself that it's out in the world and anyone can do with it whatever they want and it's no more mine. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be okay with that. Yeah. And that's something that bothers me all the time, but it's also something that um, I feel like maybe someone will read it and resonate. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of scary knowing that people will take whatever they want from your work, that once you put it out there, you have absolutely no control over it anymore. I feel like the pseudonym is also a long and time-honored tradition in uh, you know, South Asian literature, but also Muslim literature. Mm -hmm. And it so happens that my great grandfather had a sister um, who never married and uh, <laughs> who, uh, who wrote, uh, who was a poet, but she had, and she had, she had a pseudonym. She didn't write under her own name. Um, so, and she wrote No Has and Marcias. And so it's really weird, like Agashad Ali had a book called Country Without a Post Office. And in it, he writes, um, he quotes a Marcia about Zainab, um, which is um, the night, what the night has fallen on the house of Hussein or something. I forget how he translates it, but it's my great aunt's Marcia. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if he knew or I don't remember if I told him or not, um, because uh, yeah, you know that he died like not that long after that book came out, like maybe four years after that book came out. So um, I mean, I remember reading it and being like, I think that is my great aunt, Marcia. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Rajiv, did you, I noticed that you unmuted yourself earlier. You had. Oh yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I like what folks have been saying so much. Um, and, you know, to its point about um, uh, contacting folks, if I have an active situation with that, with that, for the person that I'm addressing, or the person that I'm writing about, then of course, like, there's a conversation, you know, that happens, like, you know, if I'm writing about, you know, X, Y, and Z, and like, you know, I'll ask friends and family, 
Um, like for example, I'm writing a memoir about something really uh, defining in my life around queerness. And um, I sent it to my mother and I asked her to, you know, read certain chapters to, you know, have her blessing really. And she's like, oh yeah, but what about these other aunts and uncles? And I was like, I don't actually have an active relationship or an active situation with these people. So, you know, how much of the narrative, um, you know, do I lend to, you know, this idea of the truth of the, of the, the person back then versus the truth of the person now who's writing that? Um, and that's some kind of like unboundaried thing that I have with myself, if that makes sense. Um, and I think with poetry, it's like everything is so elastic or plastic even um, that, you know, things can bend and conflations happen and um, emotional resonance for me is the thing that's important. Um, you know, I, I try not to use names, um, but like that doesn't mean um, I was talking to, I can't remember who I was talking to about this, but um, they, they had an address to somebody and they were like, they were asking me, what do you do in this case? And I was like, well, what's their middle name? Use that initial and then, you know, a, a dash afterwards as a way to kind of like lend some kind of, um, you know, a, a level of uh, uh, a veil, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. But that's just a, one of those like pragmatic things that doesn't work for everything in private. That's good. Yeah. I want to add, can I add something again? Of course. It occurred to me while Raji was speaking. Like on a very practical, because I think I spoke like philosophically before, but I think on a very practical level, you know, you can write about what you want, but you may maybe do something like write into fiction uh, or something like that. Um, so I've written about both of my parents in my poetry, but I have not written about either of my sisters or you know, most in general, my family, very little. Um, and there is to some degree about writing about my parents that I own, cause that's like a life that impacted mine, what they did and how, what they say. Whereas with my sisters, it's like, maybe the power dynamic is a little different because we're siblings. I'm a writer, neither of them are writers. And so, you know, that person, there's something about that relationship that feels to me like I probably will not do. Um, on the other hand, I wrote a book of short stories in which um, uh, it's called Uncle Sharif's Life in Music. And in the first story, there's a set of cousins and they're all, they're all based on my siblings and my cousins, but it's a story, you know? So I think there's ways like you just have to think about, um, you know, Louise Glick, the poet who just recently was given the Nobel prize. She talked about how she used to write about her son when he was younger. And then when he turned 16, I think, she asked him, is it okay if I keep writing about you? And he said, no. And she said, okay, I guess that's it. I don't, I don't get that anymore. So we, do, we have relationships. We have our own sense of, you know, our own experiences and lives as writers that we have the moral right to. And then we have those relationships that we have to negotiate. And so there are different practical strategies for writing about anything that you feel like writing about. You should not be blocked, you know, that there's something is forbidden to you. I, do, I don't at all mean to imply that. Yeah, I think keeping power dynamics and what stories you have a right to in mind is also really important. Like, like you don't know what the impact of your work is gonna be. You're just saying that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so Mimi asks, and also says a little bit, the world that belongs to us is possibly the first anthology with such an incredible range of South Asian queer poetry, both from the home countries and several diasporas, well-known poets and newcomers, and also some translations from non-English languages. What do you think this book does for the canon and tradition of South Asian queer poetry, as well as locating your own work within it? And I know Ruth mentioned at some point you knew of one other, you know, lesbian South Asian poet. I wonder how has that changed or is it sort of similar now? Well, when I did my research on same-sex love in India, I of course discovered many, many more, and not all of them would define themselves as gay lesbian. Well, they were writing about that. And um, and then of course later now and I did have one uh, a girlfriend in the nineties with whom where we had a poetic dialogue we were poetry to each other, 
And then of course I've now I know of others of Al Rashad Ali and and others. So you know. gotcha. What do you do you think that this book does for this canon and tradition? Or has it changed anything that you can see yet for all of you? I think when Akhil and Aditi have been writing about this in interviews in various places, they said they, they, they're very um, transparent about the fact that an anthology is just a starting point and that it couldn't possibly be canonical, um, mm. especially given queerness and, you know, how queerness can work to upset categorizations. And I think like, uh, you know, showing us the possibility of things in translation or, you know, uh, of diasporic communities that aren't necessarily like at the table front and center, I think the hope I, is, I imagine is to spark a conversation for uh, more kinds of anthology on the anthologies to emerge or um, more kinds of conversations around this to happen. So I think like, it's kind of like clearing a space in my mind, in my mind, it clears a space that we can stand and be like, well, there's also this thing or, you know, what about this? Or um, I, I don't know if that's like too um, uh, neoliberal of an answer. <laughs> so. No, I think it was the perfect answer. <laughs> it's okay. I want to read a, just a short excerpt from the introduction to the anthology. Yeah. Um, they say that to the editors right here, um, then there is the, that other sword hanging over us like it hangs over most anthologists' necks, the question of quality, in quotes. This goodness of good hyphenness, this goodness of a poem itself is a jumpy thing. You can't tell if it lies within the poem or in the perceptions of the people outside it. Surely the social world's cultural clout linguistic position of the readers inflects their understanding of this goodness. And if the editors select only those poems which will pass the narrow test of quality, surely they are imposing not only their taste, but also the social and cultural foundations which more it. And we know taste or its close friend merit in South Asia is a loaded thing. It replicates social hierarchy. It unhears caste and class. It pretends cultural capital does not exist. It ignores linguistic diversity and odd hierarchies which creep in between languages. It ignores linguistic diverse, excuse me, it is not able to digest that each poem has an echo. Each of it is a conversation, a meditation, a quarrel, which different readers are poised to hear differently. So for the question that we had arrived at, is there something imminent in the poem that makes it good or bad? Our answers were no longer sure. This anthology has been produced with this uncertainty dancing in the middle of the room rather than sitting quietly in the corner. Yeah, it sounds like <clears throat> the anthology is making space kind of like what Rajiv said, it's not necessarily doing anything right now, but it's a potential of something. I think it also problematizes the canon because yeah such a wide range of uh, poems from like different time periods. Um, and like, it feels, it almost feels, um, I guess, I don't know the, the right word, but like, it feels weird to put them all together, but weird in like a really beautiful way because it's um, basically disrupting what the canon should look like and whether there should be a South Asian queer canon um, and the way South Asian queerness has been canonized, I guess, in some um, texts has been really problematic in, in many ways. So I think that this anthology is trying to uh, disrupt the idea of what a South Asian queer canon should look like. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um... So Navia asks, whose works are you inspired by these days? And I kind of also want to add in, um, does like how does being in a queer community help inspire or inform and create your work? Because that's what I, I'm interested in. <laughs> does anybody want to start? who's inspiring me these days. <laughs> um, 
I'm reading a really, ter um, re reading because I'm teaching it and, and teaching it right now, a really interesting book by Elizabeth Gross um, called uh, Chaos Territory Art, uh, which looks at uh, Deleuze, Deleuze's theory of, of creation. Um, and uh, it's kind of like where this concept of territory that we are all in right now, where you know, my world is the four walls of my house mostly, although I go out every once in a while into the wider world, but I've, I'm kind of fixed in place in a sense. And the quality that time has taken on in this moment that we're living in, it's a still moment in that we're suspended in time and wondering, you know, when is this going to be over? When will we see our parents again or our friends who live in other cities? Um, but it's also a time of great um, social unrest um, since the um, killing of George Floyd, but just before that, there was, you know, the young man in Georgia and also uh, the bird watcher in Central Park. Like, I mean, this sort of moment that has been crashed, crashed down on our heads, basically. And uh, the, in the United States, anyways, the election and the uncertainty of the future so it's, you know, it's, this is necessarily going to affect the way we think it, it's been affecting the way I sleep and the way we talk to each other and it, it will affect our creative lives as well. Um, so that, you know, who knows what the art coming out of this time period is people are writing and some of this stuff is even being published. Um, I, I actually, so two of the poems that I've written in quarantine time are in the current issue of Poetry Magazine, if you're interested in seeing <laughs> what it's done to me. Um, but, uh, you know, any poet is got, is like got in a psychic antenna, you know, up and is picking up the vibes of, of what's around, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm very inspired by Cosm's uh, work, actually. Um, I have, I brought like a, a, a little stack of books of uh, things that I'm reading right now and I put Cosmos in the top so that I could be like, this is a great book, everyone needs to read it. Um, but then also like, uh, you know, and when we get to the, what are you reading now? I'll expose like the rest of the books that I'm, th that I am, am, am wading through. But I've been really inspired by uh, Soako Nakayasu's work um, as a translator and poet. Her translations of um, Chika Sagawa um, you know, have been really interesting. And she's been kind of, I've seen, I, I've given a, a papers with her a couple times and she always blows my mind and such has such wonderful conversations around the queer art or how to queer the art of translation. And so that's something that I've taken very deep within myself right now as I'm working towards like another project of translation. Of these, not, not, not my Chutney poems, but like of actual Chutney songs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been really interesting to visit the sonic world um, of these songs and then to like think about the violence of, you know, putting them onto the page and then also like, what does it mean that, you know, there's several stages of this writing by hand, typing on a computer, type in, typing in Devanagari, typing in Latin letters or Roman letters or whatever we call it. And, and that's just something that's been kind of, well, how do I expose this process in revealing what, uh, you know, language is doing or can do when it's um, either embodied or, limp on the page. And that's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, and also I've uh, recently reread um, all of Mina Alexander's po books of poems um, with the most recent uh, to her first collection. And that has been quite a wonderful way for me to think about uh, the magic of image and line um, and her work there is very tight. Mm. High femme as uh, Kasim calls it. What about you, Akbar? Um, I just finished reading Akweke Imezi, The Death of Vivek Oji, um, which is a beautiful novel. It broke my heart and then rebuilt it. Um, and I, I felt very moved by it, but I also had to take, I read it in like one day because I couldn't put it down. And then I had to take um, a lot of rest afterwards. Yeah. Um, I think one other poet who constantly inspires me is Dana Smith. I have been reading their um, book, Homey, and I just feel like the, the, the exploration of friendship as love and as really beautiful, lasting love is very inspiring for me because it like makes me think of how um, our relationships are all we have. 
I think the other thing that like has always inspired me since I was young are Qawwalis. Um, I listen to Qawwalis a lot, um, particularly in the morning when I wake up to to start my day because they feel like a portal into a different world. Um, I also listen to them in the shower. Um, yeah, so I I just feel like it's a very very sort of um, bodily experience for me. Yeah. And that, that definitely like takes me into the world of poetry, takes me into the world of music. So my partner and I have discovered, recently discovered the joys of Cook Studio on YouTube. <laughs> Who is that, Marco? What? Who is the Hawali singer you love? Oh, Abida Parveen. Abida Parveen is like the new, di- she's the new diva uh, in our house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm like, not a fan of Coke Studio because it like completely appropriates Sufi culture and like <laughs> turns it all like neoliberal. Um, yeah, but Abida Parveen is beautiful and also so queer. We love Abida Parveen like in, on and off Coke she Studio. She gives me such big earth mama lesbian vibes. <laughs> I don't know her situation, but... <laughs> And uh, Amjad Sabri is uh, also, you know, uh, actually Amjad Sabri is um, one of the poems in my book is a, a partially about Amjad Sabri, but yeah. Mm, yeah, I think the beautiful thing to me about Kavali is that even though it's pretty dominated by men, it's it's such a femme uh, form. Like I just feel like all of these people who live as men in their lives, they uh, channel this like super beautiful sexual femme energy. Um, and you can't tell the difference between God and the lover and sex and prayer and that, yeah. Sex is yeah. prayer. Sex is prayer, yeah. Fight me. But I also think that when we start talking about, you know, when the sort of uh, like nationalist drums start getting beat, I think about the hybridity at the core of South Asian culture is is ancient Mm -hmm. and the manifestations are many. So, you know, it's just, you know, Qawwali singer, you know, meet the Kirtanwala over here. You know what I mean? And it's like, can you not hear? Actually, you're singing the same tune sometimes, literally. so I feel like there's a lot that we, like the cultural work um, can be done to show, you know, the national, you know, just like what were we talking about earlier when the same thing sort of came up? Oh, when Ruth was saying like the historical roots of, mm-hmm. you know, queerness throughout history. And it's like the interpretation of Islamic culture as a queer unfriendly or same sex unfriendly is really, really modern. It's not in the medieval or, you know, classical Islamic times. And there are plenty of relationships that were like, you know, known same-sex relationships, you know? And it's just like that picture of medieval Europe that's created in modern times by, you know, Hollywood film or whatever is completely untrue. There were Arabs and, you know, people when when they did that new, um, remember uh, Kevin Costner, they did that Robin Hood movie and Morgan Freeman was the friend and everybody was up in arms. They're like, there there were no, you know, black people in London in 1200 AD. And it's like, excuse me, yes, there were many and Arabs and, uh, you know, whatever, you know, Spain had been Arab since 711 actually, you know? So that like whitewashing of history and that straightwashing of history, that's super 20th century. Not really, it's super 18th century, but it was in service of the empire. It was, you know, to, it had a political purpose. Similarly, modern day Hindu nationalism that excludes the Muslim from Indian culture. It's just not true. Yeah. Yeah, and it it just serves um, like nationalist interests. And I think flattening the past in general is serves the powers that be when like South Asian, the South Asian subcontinent has always been multicultural, multi-religious and always been like a huge mixing pot. So, yeah. Um, what are you all working on right now? I know Kazan was talking about his choose your own adventure, um, but what else? And like, what about the rest of you? I'm also working on a memoir that's gonna be coming out in March. It's coming out soon. Um, And it is a memoir of my Canadian childhood called Northern Light. 
Um, my dad was a, an engineer of a hydroelectric dam project that was located on unceded First Nations land. And uh, 40 years after I left, when I moved from there when I, in 1977, I was six years old, um, I went back to the Cross Lake First Nation, which is the nation upon whose land the dam was. And I, I spent time in, in the community interviewing people, studying the environmental impact of the dam and reckoning with what my family had been a part of. Yeah. So. Wow. That's it's a cheerful book. <laughs> yeah. Just like reckoning with your entire life history there. Yeah. Light. so many but I do think and you started with the land recognition right I'm on Kumaya lands here um, I think so many of us who come as South Asian immigrants into the United States we are trying to access this national space in our case Canadian national space that the actual indigenous people don't we have more access to it than they do yeah the, I, that's the irony of that so this book tries to contend with the meeting of uh, the conflict between the immigrant and the indigenous and that Canadian national space in between. Yeah. Sounds awesome. I would love to read that. Yeah, I'm excited. What about Rajiv and Atas? What are you working on right now? I, so I'm working on my dissertation, which is slow <laughs> and it's killing me and it's a painful process. Oh God. Um, yeah, um, but that's not really something that gives me joy these days. I think um, I haven't written a poem in a really long time. And I feel like the more that I, um, the, the less traumatized I feel in the world and the better I feel about life and myself, the less poems are right, um, which is kind of sad, but also yeah. not sad, yeah. Yeah, what, so what's, I guess, the not what are you working on, but what is giving you joy in this moment? What's giving you life? Um, so I am working on a speculative short story, which is on cannibalism in Pakistan. Um, so a couple of years ago, there were these uh, stories of these, um, we call them Adam Khor in, in Urdu, but basically people who ate people. Uh, and I'm trying to write a story that's a love story um, between two people, one of whom asks the other to like consume her once she dies. So the other person is consuming her and then being accused of cannibalism. Wow, I love queer, like sci-fi and fantasy. I just, I feel like we have the like phone line to like what's actually cool and transgressive and new. And that's really exciting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what about you, Rajiv? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's so fun to hear about uh, y'all's works in progress. Uh, I'm editing two things that are coming out next year. And, you know, well, I was gonna say, um, pulling out my hair, but I mean, maybe doing other kinds of uh, picking my my fingernails over them, thinking like, oh God, what's gonna co what's gonna come of these? And the one is a collection of poems that I, I read from a poem from today uh, cut, uh, called Katlish, which is the the word from rural Guyana that means machete, um, but in the Caribbean called katlas. Katlas is like you know a tool that is used for um, households, excuse me, household, um, you know, things like cutting coconuts and, you know, clearing land, but then also like uh, perpetrate violence against uh, women and queers in the Caribbean. So there's that as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the, this memoir about, um, you know, uh, queerness in my family and in myself and what that meant for me. Um, it's a, it's my, the memoir is actually hybrid work. So it's like, some classical Hindustani music, some Carnatic music, some um, poetry, some essay, um, and some photos, so, yeah. Music seems to be really important to and entwined with your work. And I guess you said earlier you wanted to be a singer, so that makes sense, but that's really cool. Thank you all so much for sharing that. Um, I know Rajiv said earlier had that like stack of things that they're, that you're reading currently. Would you want to share with that? Yes, absolutely. So, okay. Um, the, the Voice of Sheila Chandra by Kazim Ali. This is one. This other one, Zom Fam by Kamala Makro. Um, and I believe they're Canadian. 
Wow, that's a beautiful cover. Oh God. I, and just like the way the, the paper and the ink, it's just also gorgeous. Um, and then I'm also looking at Emporium by Aditi Machado. Um, and I am so taken by this writer. I think they're like a genius um, in so many ways. Um, you know, they're also a translator. Um, so Aditi's book, and then um, this book called Bittersweet Poems by Natasha Ramaltar. And she, uh, she is also Canadian from Scarborough, Toronto. Um, and uh, she gave a book launch last night that I said last night, that I, that I went to, if, if not last night, then the night before. Um, but I wanted to um, I wanted to show a poem, it's called Translation by Sound, that I just absolutely love. Keep in mind, this was written by an Indo-Caribbean woman who doesn't know any South Asian language um, intimately. And so, you know, uh, translation by sound, uh, aching, as, and then she goes through like counting, ek do tin chad panch, che sat, sat, at, no and aching like a long lost bird, like a doe from her mother, uh, like the young teen with her half mended heart. It's just fabulous. And the punctuation is also like in that kind of um, way. And so thinking about those queer translations and the, the elasticity of the page and, and, and language and that kind of thing, it just kind of really tickled me. So thank you for the question. Oh, yes, and uh, Rita um, just, wanted to recommend a recent Assamese film, Amis, talking about Adam Kaur. Um, so yeah, you should check it out. That's so cool. Um, so we have been talking for a while now and, ah, one second, sorry. Um, we've been talking for a while now and I just wanted to maybe uh, close us out with one final question, which sort of to, wrap everything together kind of, and also a kind of selfish question as I am a poet that wants your advice, but do you, do you all have any advice for aspiring poets or for people that want to try writing poetry? And I guess you can interpret this question in any way that you want to. I will tell you to go out and buy a book called The Veiled Suite, which is the collected poems of Aga Shahid Ali, and read that book cover to cover. Thank you. I think my advice would be like to read widely um, and to read things that you aren't necessarily always drawn to. Um, you know, I think that, you know, with the breadth uh, comes like, or, or, or you can clarify for yourself what a stake would be for your speakers in your poems, if that's how you're thinking about your poems and the construction of like the, the universe for your poems. Um, and it's cool because, uh, you know, in doing so, you're going to be exposed to so many different ways of thinking and so many different uses of language and sound and um, all of it is, uh, all of it is important and good, um, unless it's not. <laughs> and then you'll know something about yourself, so then it is again. Yeah, like it's all just a process of getting larger internally, kind of increasing your capacity. I would say that um, in a way, all poets are aspiring poets because we're all like aspiring towards something, um, towards like a greater form of feeling or something. I, I think one of the best um, pieces of advice that I ever got was to write every day, um, to not simply wait for inspiration. Of course, we wait for inspiration. And I usually do write when, you know, there's something that's happening in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but if you build a practice of writing something every day, whether it's like journaling or just critiquing something, um, I think it's, uh, it, it builds practice. Um, it's, it's, it's a piece of advice that I don't follow. <laughs> but I, I will give it out. I feel like most advice I give is like, yeah, I know this is the right thing to do, but I definitely don't do it. <laughs> I appreciate it nonetheless. And thank you all so much. This has been so fun and I feel so lucky to be here and to have like introduced all of you. And yeah, this was such a great thing to do on Saturday. I'm in the process of moving right now and I'm really stressed out. And this was really just like bomb for my soul. <laughs> Thank you. And Sumati, is there, do you have anything to say to sort of wrap us out? Or is, do any of you want to say anything at the end? Just thank you to everybody who's here. And thank you to everyone who's listening. And it's kind of 
fanboying about being on a panel with the legendary Ruth Vanita. So that was really cool. Me too. Me too. <laughs> when I saw her name, I got like a little shaky. <laughs> yeah. So thanks, everybody. And this is the book. This is the anthology. Yeah. And it's really beautiful. This is the Indian edition. I There is either currently or soon to be a US edition. And these are the amazing people who edited it. So hope you check it out. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your words and your hearts. This is a lovely to be here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, everyone. One thing that I'm thinking of uh, a lot these days is that I need to read more Dalit poets. And I will just ask everyone in the audience to explore more Dalit poets. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Sumati or Rita, is there 